Okay, we're going to take a look this morning at the third chapter in the same book that I preached from a few weeks ago. We're still in the book of Philippians. And uh, that Bethany home where I normally do my work in Ripon, uh, we've made it to chapter three. Um, so last week, I was in a different church in Ripon. I preached in the same text. Um, but I want to share it with you today as well. Chapter three, we'll start with you at verse one. 1 through 12. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own, that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And here we'll end the reading for today's purposes. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thanks be to God. It's always good to see how God's hand is in the details of life. And um, I think the text uh, suits itself well, as we are uh, reminded already this morning that uh, many Christians in the Presbyterian Reformed uh, tradition celebrate Reformation, uh, the Reformation history that is ours. That's our identity. Theologically, that's our heritage. And so we have much reason to celebrate that. Uh, and I wish that all Christians would, because it is the gospel. I don't know what your week was like, but I've noticed that um, ever since I came to America, actually, way back, that um, we have kind of a superficial way of greeting one another. Let's say um, you met some person last week at Safe Mart, if there is a Safe Mart, I don't know, but let's just say there's a Safe Mart here, um, and your week or day was not going that well. And you met that person from church or somebody else, and the person said to you, uh, How are you doing? Great. Fine. How are you? Isn't that the typical response that most of us give? And I've always thought to myself, there's a sense of, uh, uh, I don't want to call it hypocrisy about that, but it's just not the truth. So, what could we say that is honest and true? And I think it is something that somebody else taught me, another person at Bethany Home. And the person says, when I hear that, that, that question, I say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. No matter what my circumstances are, in Christ, I am totally blessed. We're blessed. We're blessed to be the children of God. 
as John puts it in his letter, and that is what we are. So my question is, if we are the children of God, what difference does it make in my day-to-day -day living? When I suppose I'm much like you, that there are good days and bad days, and sometimes God takes us through seasons of bad days, struggles, trials, difficulties, and how much influence does my faith has, actually, practically, um, in terms of how I experience my relationship with Jesus Christ. I've come to see, hopefully, I've come to see in light of God's word, that I need to call my Lord and Savior every day into every detail of my life. I cannot artificially separate him from all kinds of practical issues that play in my life, but he wants to be my Lord in all those areas. And that of course includes things neutral, indifferent, great, positive, but also the sufferings that are common to us. How do we invite Jesus into every part of our lives? How do we view and do our jobs at home or professionally? How do we view our role and responsibilities in our community, in our cities, in the church? How do we view the Lordship of Jesus Christ in marriage, in family, especially when there are struggles? We have a relationship with Christ, but what does it mean that He is my Lord and that He is my Savior? The text that we are looking at this morning is therefore vitally important because it brings us back to the really the theological ABCs of what we believe. The Apostle warns us in this passage and warns the Philippians way back then against a works-based religion and outlook on life. There are three things I want to discuss with you quickly. Well, I'm not sure quickly. Last time I wasn't very quick. Um, but uh, I do know, I see a big clock back there. I'll, I'll do my best. The first uh, thought that I thought I'd share with you is Paul's unforgiving position. Then Paul's high priority. And then finally, Paul's lifelong pursuit. And if you want to do it a little bit differently in your own mind for the sake of remembering, you could think about past, present, and future. But Paul is warning against a works-based religion and how, again, that coincides with what we're celebrating this weekend particularly, because um, it has everything to do with that, why he's so unforgiving. And then Paul's high priority, and then finally his lifelong pursuit. Paul's unforgiving position. When you read this, you think to yourself, living in 2019, how in the world can he talk like that? Watch out for those dogs, verse 2. Those men who do evil, mutilators of the flesh. We think that Paul is going a little too far. We just simply don't talk like that. Um, or at least most of us don't talk like that. But we also have to, we all have to remember that the Apostle Paul is not just mad. He's not having a bad day. He's not angry. He's not emotional. He is truly upset, and I think it is a righteous indignation. He's not in a bad mood, in other words. He is coming from a perspective that is entirely new. Because an event took place in his life some years before that changed his life around. Just like it did Martin Luther, incidentally. When he heard about the gospel, that there's a the righteousness that comes from the gospel to him, not from the law, which can only suppress and oppress and depress, um, life changed completely. And he never went back. He burned that bridge. That's where Paul is coming from. Paul, uh, Paul has met Jesus on the way to Damascus. And Paul has come to see 
that these people who are, who are starting to come into the churches that he had helped establish, at least some of them. There are people coming back into the church who say, Jesus plus something. And in this case, it seems to be that they're advocating, probably from their own Jewish background, having become followers of Christ, and say, yeah, but if you really want to be accepted in God's sight as his you know, adopted children, then you need to also, males, be circumcised. And somebody at the Gospel Mission, when I shared that story with them last week, said, ouch! <laughs> That's what you kind of get when you're at the Gospel Mission. I don't expect it from you. Uh, but um, it, it is terrible. It is terrible when you start adding something to the Gospel. Because you have no Gospel left. You either stand righteous before God or you don't. And it is on the basis not of you or me or what we have done or didn't do or hope to accomplish. This is Christ's finished work. That's why he's mad. That's why he calls them dogs. The Jews call Gentiles dogs. Dogs and others, but people, and the, the Gentiles particularly, who were not under the law, didn't keep the law. They were unclean. He wants to point out that having included now the gospel plus something, they've lost it entirely. But it is something that the church needs to pay attention to, especially the leadership in the church. You're the guards. You're the watchmen on the walls. Don't get too worried about this, this sort of vehement language. Jesus used it. Call people hypocrites. John the Baptist called the same folk brood of vipers. So the Bible is okay about being a little upset about things. As long as it is righteous indignation. But thank the Lord for Paul. That when he needs to be, for the most part he's very soft and tender and pastoral. But when he needs to be, he's going to tell you the truth. And whoever comes in this place to bring you the word of God from week to week, he better tell you the truth when it needs to be taught clearly, crisply, and succinctly. Because he, along with the leadership here, have the holy, sacred task of shepherding the flock, keeping you together, and bringing you before the Savior week by week by week. It's very important. And we thank the Lord once again that Paul spoke truth. Paul speaks from experience. This is not something that he had gained at seminary, theological head knowledge. He speaks from experience, faith experience, gospel experience. He'd been under the law, knew what that was like, now he has come to freedom in Christ. There's nobody more zealous to keep the law than he was. But the Lord hit him with a two by four on his way to Damascus. God struck him with blindness. Three days he had to think about which way he wanted to go. Well, he came, as we all know the story, basically from the book of Acts, he came to see that he had had it all wrong. And that was an immense admission for Paul to make. He had given his heart, his life, his everything. The way you and I as Christians are called to give our everything to the Lord Jesus Christ in our day-to-day -day service. Paul gave his everything. Not for sports, not for entertainment. He gave his everything for his God. Imagine what it must have been like to come to the realization that it was all for naught. That he had to burn it up, leave it behind like trash that you place at the curb in front of your house and the city will pick it up and throw it away somewhere. If we have any thoughts of coming before the Lord someday and he asks us, why would I let you into my heaven? If we have any thoughts about saying, well, Lord, I love you very much and I went to church a lot and I gave money to this, that organization, 
and I volunteered at BBS and all the things that you can mention, as if that would make God somehow happy. God would so much say, hey, I am impressed with that young man. I'll let him in. If you have any thoughts like that, thank the Lord that you're here today. Because God is good to you. Because today you're hearing a message that you need to hear and that I need to hear every day. I am saved by grace alone from beginning to end. Grace, 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 grace. Every day I need grace. Because I'm a sinner. Like you. I know all about it. And I know the Lord knows all about it too. I trust in Christ. He's my only hope. Is He your hope? Is He your refuge? Do you trust in His finished work for you completely? Or are you doing what Paul used to do and he added up all kinds of things and he could list it all and be proud about it, boast about it? But it is all garbage. It is rubbish. It is, as it says in the Greek, dung. Some of us know about dung. Few of us do. We know what it smells like, we know what it looks like, we know what it feels like. Um, that's what God says of your goodness. Your goodness. Not your badness, but your goodness. You have to give it up. You have to give it over. You have to bow down before the cross and leave it behind. You have to reach out to the Lord's words of promise, of hope for you. Because without Him and without His word, you're lost. It was a time in my life when I needed the Lord very, very much. It was in 1970 when my brother and I were uh, vacationing with my parents, of course, took us there. Um, and uh, we were camping on an island called Tessel. Some of us know that island, if you've been there maybe. Um, and uh, my brother was two years old, I was about 12, uh, 10, and he was about 13, I suppose. And uh, he, he's the fisherman. He's the only fisherman in my family. Um, and likes to fish, but he thought he'd bring me along that day. I don't know what my parents were thinking or doing. I think they were disqualified to be parents ever since that day happened. Um, but uh, we were on the beach, and the uh, tide had gone out, like a way, way out. Not just like 100 feet or you know, way out, because uh, the system there works that if the tide goes way out, you can actually go from island to island walking. So that's how far the water had retreated. And then we were looking for worms so that he could do his fishing. And it had just been my birthday that week. And my parents had given me some nice shoes, you know, basketball shoes. Um, <coughs> Of course, that was 1970, so kind of different kind of basketball shoes back in those days. Um, and I was carrying that with me, and uh, we were doing our thing, and slowly but surely the water was coming back up. And it wasn't so slowly, actually it went rapidly. And my brother tells the same story still to this day, so we corroborate this deal that the water got up so fast that it reached, for me at some point, at my chest. And the beach was still way up there. And it was getting higher and higher, and... I don't know that we were in a frenzy particularly, but it was getting pretty serious. And what did I have to do to help myself to wade through the slush underneath in the water? I had to get rid of something that I had just gotten. My birthday presents. <laughs> but you have to throw away what you have to throw away, my friends, if you're going to go to heaven. God provided his redemption that day. Out of nowhere, there was nobody to be seen anywhere. All of a sudden, on the left, little boat, 
the man pushing it forward with his children inside. And he took us along to the beach, to our camping ground, in his beautiful French limousine, Citroën. They are really the, you know, the, the Cadillac of the French fleet. Beautiful car. I think I still remember its color, maroon. Um, but to show you, it's an illustration, it's a story, and it's trying to communicate to you what faith is like. Faith every day. Not just when you have cancer or something, your house is on fire or something terrible. But every day, you have to have a sacred abandonment of everything. Every day you have to say, Lord, this is my wife, these are my children, this is my farm, this is my house, this is my second, third, fourth property, doesn't matter what it is. My grandchildren, oh yeah, they're important to me. Ooh. They're yours. Totally. I live today as though I had nothing. As though I have nothing. Because I need to surrender all. And Michelle, thank you so much for the wonderful songs that you've selected for today's purposes. So, the Apostle Paul is angry, but for just reason. He's protecting the gospel. And by protecting the gospel as a preacher, as a missionary, he's protecting you as the congregants, as the members of the flock of Jesus. And so then he talks about his high priority. I want to read it to you, verses 7 through 9. This is from the ESV, by the way. It says there, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. He's done with that. But that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. What was Paul's all-consuming priority? To know more about the law, about his Jewish heritage, However interesting and fascinating that is, we should be, as Christians, we should love the Old Testament. We shouldn't just be known as people who know the New Testament, Old Testament. That's where our roots are, in the Jewish people of God. What God did among them, His mighty acts, His acts of redemption. But we need to know more than just about what God did back then. We need to have a relationship, as we often say, because faith is personal. For Paul, it had been duty, mostly duty, if not totally duty. He did his, his, his acts of, of flawless obedience, according to the standard of the law, out of duty. Not because he loved his God, not because he, he had been set free, like you and I are in Christ, so that when we hear the law, whether you read it today or not, or uh, in other services, uh, you, when you hear the law, you say, Lord, that is good news, in the sense that it has been fulfilled. The Lord Jesus has come, and he, by his perfect obedience, and doing all that work in my place, he has set me free, so that I'm now unshackled, and I can go out into the world and love God above all, and my neighbor as myself. And I take God's word very seriously, whether it's in Genesis or Exodus or Leviticus or Revelation, because it's all God's word. It's inspired by him. But he wants to keep the law, the law of his God, the God who saved him, out of gratitude. We call that the third use of the law. Out of gratitude, we wish to obey our blessed Savior. The Apostle Paul calls it the, the obedience that is of faith. The Apostle Paul, in this letter, talks about the day of Christ. 
here and there. In his way of understanding salvation for us in this life, he views his life, his ministry, his calling from the perspective, not only of the one who saved him on the cross, who is at the same time the one who is coming again. He has risen once, he is going to call us to rise with him the second time, if you will, when he comes again and he calls us into the glory of his heavenly Father to show us off as his beloved bride. bride. And so the Apostle Paul says, I want to know this Christ who is my Savior, this one who gave his life for me, this one who is risen from the grave. He overcome, he overcame death for me, hell for me, my eternal judgment for me. And so the Apostle Paul is thinking about heaven. He has a certain heaven-mindedness to his faith that inspires and shapes his day-to-day -day living. Do you have the same concern? Is this your priority? That this week you look at your faith as a Christian from the perspective that Jesus is coming again, your Lord is coming again. And when he comes again, then your foremost desire is, passion is, to be found in him. Because that is what that day will reveal. And so the question today for us becomes, on this 28th, I believe, of, the, of October, the year of our Lord, 2018, are you in Him? Or are you still outside of Him? You know about Him. Your parents say, go mow the lawn, and you do it. Or, you know, other things that you do. And outwardly, you're pretty good, pretty decent person. Neighbors, if you ask your neighbors, say, hey, these are nice people. But are you in Him? Are you in Christ? Have you abandoned everything that you were looking for? Even praying for? Because as Christians, I find myself in a way that I'm praying for certain things and I pray and pray and pray. Not much happening. Not much changing. Maybe I prayed the wrong way. Maybe it's how Paul prays when he asks for the Lord to remove the thorn from his flesh. And he prayed and he prayed and he prayed and the Lord finally said, My grace. My grace is sufficient. We have to ask the risen Lord Jesus Christ. We have to invite the Lordship of our King into our every part of our lives, including the things that give us struggle. He wants to be a part of it. So let's make this practical. Let's just say that there's a couple here that is struggling. I don't know you from Adam, okay? I don't know you at all. But let's just say, because it happens all over the place, Let's just say that you have a, a struggle in your marriage. Or you have a struggle with your children. Or you could make another example. You could say, well, uh, my, my parents, uh, you know, um, my mother, my father, uh, you know, we need to think about a higher level of care. And that's a big decision, big change. How do you view those things? Is that also for the psychologist, the counselor? Or do you and I have a responsibility to attack this rotten problem and to say, by faith, by faith, if my faith is going to mean anything, by faith, I love you, I'm committed to you, and I'm going to, with the help of God, by the power and presence of His Holy Spirit, I am going to try from now on, my very best, whether it's reciprocated or not, in kindness and so forth, but I am going to do, by George, by faith, what I must do as a Christian. Love you, honor you, respect you, everything I ought to do as a husband or a wife. 
How about if we, if, if we start practicing our Christianity? How about applying this to our relationship with our parents? When I was a teenager, I didn't get along all that great with my father. You know, he was a good man. He was a very good man. Very honorable, Christian man, served the church, everything. Wasn't unfaithful, never cursed, um, but it's just the way things happen in life. And maybe you can relate to that. And then you come to know Jesus. And you come to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And then you have this dad that you can't get along with. Well, how is it going to work out? Unless you start applying what you believe to your relationship with your dad, your mom, and so forth. It seems rather clear to me now, more than it used to be, that we need to invite the Lordship of Jesus Christ into every area of our lives. And it cannot happen if we continue to be distracted by everything else under the sun. There's a lot of things that are distracting us, aren't there? Whether it's the World Series, I don't know who's winning or losing. Whether it's the milk price is down or up. Whatever it is that we're dealing with. Does our faith remind us? Too much time there. It's part of the done. When Jesus comes again, World Series, Hollywood. I did a funeral yesterday. Christian lady, Joe Van Pompenberg. When Jesus comes again, it's going to be a big, big burial. And God is going to do the officiating. And God is going to do the officiating in Hollywood and in Washington and in Peking or Beijing. He's going to have the ceremony over anything and everything and everyone who is godless and wicked and deserves the judgment fully and will receive it unless there is repentance and faith in Christ. That day is coming. So let's get with it, folks. Let's get with the program, God's program. God above all. And my neighbor is myself. Because I want to gain Christ. When Jesus comes again, I want him to, I want him to find me faithful. Because he has given his all for me. He died for me, even though he didn't have to. But he did it anyway, because that is divine love. We can't figure it out. And then finally, the pursuit. I've already touched on it, so I'm going to keep it very short. But the, the lifelong pursuit is that uh, he once again says in verses 10 through 12 that he wants to know Christ and his resurrection and to join him in his suffering. That's an interesting, almost contradiction, huh? paradox. Resurrection, meaning life, victory, conquest, and then to join Christ in his sufferings. But that is our call. As we live in this world, and there's a lot of things that I enjoy about this world. God has given me a good wife. I have a good job. I have a beautiful home. I have food on the table. I have clothes to wear. And more. To think about all these things that I want to know him better and that I want to know him better so that when the sufferings continue to come into my life as they are I'm sure in your life as God brings his sufferings into our lives these sufferings themselves become opportunities that's a different way of looking at suffering but the sufferings become opportunity divine golden opportunity just like, if I may make a political point here, the thousands of people who are marching on their way to the border here, golden opportunity to show the world what grace is, what mercy is, what kindness is. 
God gives us kindness all the time. And sufferings are opportunities to invite the Savior into our life. And to use that moment that he gives us to draw closer to him. And to proclaim his name all the more to those who are around me. And so may the Lord give us strength. Strength of faith. Childlike faith. Not, you know, macho faith. But childlike faith. To follow the shepherd. Who laid down his life for you. The cross is the symbol that constantly reminds us of his great love for us. And so at the end he says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. None of us have finished the race. We are all in the process of being refined, transformed into the image of Christ in us. May the Lord give you joy. May the Lord give you faith. May the Lord give you grace to trust in Him and to call upon His Lordship and the power of His resurrection into every part that is weak in you and me. To the glory of His name. Amen. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians. How fresh it is to us and new and nothing has changed really in terms of what we need to hear for us today. And so Heavenly Father we pray humbly that your Holy Spirit will take these truths and that you would apply them to us so that our lives continue to be changed for the sake of your name until Jesus comes again.